So this is the flipped version of lecture number four on nonlinear narrative, which is part of the year one series on creativity and computing in the primary school. You'll all, I'm sure, be familiar with linear fiction. That's how most books work. It's one page after another. It's one chapter after another. And it's how films work, because they are you know, one little tiny square of transparency after another one. They're, they're, they're very much embedded in a linear approach. Computer games are a little different, though. And whilst many do take a linear storyline and have a linear plot development, there are a number in there are a large number of games which actually have a non-linear structure to them. I want you to be aware of that and I want you to be able to build in a non-linear approach to the computer game that you're developing. Besides which, this is a very interesting way of thinking about story, of thinking about a whole host of things. So over on the left here is the way we have is the way a lot of traditional media, a lot of media, um, approaches things. It is, as I say, one thing after another. Time works like that. We make our way through time sort of one moment after another. There's very much a linear flow to um, things which are based around time. So history, um, you know, notoriously, is one thing after another. Um, the notion of the learning journey, the notion of, oops, the notion of the learning journey of curriculum based around that idea of one of a sequence of lessons, of one lesson after another, of one topic after another, of one year or one level after another. We're very familiar with the notion of planning a school curriculum around a, a learning journey model. And of course your lessons will be a sequence of activities, very typically, one thing after another. The lesson plan form that Roehampton makes you fill in has on the back page there what happens at each point during the lesson. We adopt a linear approach to this. The blogs that you're writing over in Blogfolio are one post after another. Books, as I say. Um, the notion of levels, um, certainly around national curriculum assessment. You know, you don't get to level six before you've got to level five. Um, the call centre, I suppose, is one way of thinking about that, of the work appears in front of you one call after another, and that's the way your work in a call centre would be very much structured. And when you're thinking of programming, of course, we're working in a procedural programming language. We're writing one set of in one instruction after another as we're putting our scratch building blocks together. That's not the only way of thinking about things. If we move over to a more spatial collection of metaphors, of a collection of interrelated things, then space doesn't have that linear sequence to it, at least once you get outside of one dimension. There's a whole collection of different things in space, and there is no obvious path through following from one to another. There is a whole collection of volume of things to explore there rather than a sequence of things to follow. Similar geography, again, traditionally all over the place. Um, so yeah, whilst we're familiar with the notion of the learning journey, it's helpful also to think in terms of the learning landscape of a collection of ideas where you can explore for yourself or with a guide there to, to help you find other in interesting areas of the landscape to investigate, to explore, to discover. And whilst, of course, you're thinking in terms of most learning happening during lessons, that is not the only place where learning takes place. Libraries have been hugely important in my education as a place where learning happens, and they take a very non-linear structure. There are all of those books there, and it's very much up to you to choose which book you read next. Um, so alongside the blog, of course, we have the wiki. Compare Blogfolio with a wiki-like approach. And you're going to spend some time exploring wikis next year when you're on the year two course with Helen. But, you know, look at Wikipedia compared to a sequence of blog posts. Very, very different. And yeah, if we're looking at sort of narrative story, yes, we know about books, but we also, I hope some of us know about games. Not all of which follow that linear structure, many of which provide a world for the player to explore. And looking at assessment, you have, instead of the level notion, a collection of different badges, one for each thing that you manage to achieve. Some of you, I'm sure, will have been Cub Scouts, Girl Guides in your time. And the approach to assessment there is very different from how we approach assessment inside the schoolroom because you have all of these different badges. And to a large extent, it's up to the Brownie, the Cub, the Girl Guide, the Scout to choose which one of those they attempt next and to work towards that perhaps in their own time perhaps with the more knowledgeable expert 
helping them there. So yeah, by all means, think about ICT as happening in call centres, but also think about ICT as happening inside the design studio, where there's a whole variety of different things happening alongside one another, where you have that net landscape rather than um, linear flow of things. It's the the work is something in which you have much more control over typically and there are several projects that a design studio is having to juggle all at the same time and in programming terms yes we, we we're familiar with the notion of procedures but if you look at what's going on in scratch each of those little sprites each of those characters can have its own sequence of instructions happening independently or interrelatedly with the others which provides a much more much richer, more complex environment. And once you get into the proper sort of computer science of, of that, you start talking about objects and classes of objects. And that provides a very different way of thinking about programming than the traditional sort of just follow one step in front of another, depending on what those steps are. So two different ways of thinking about it. And we focus very much, I would suggest, on this linear side of things. And it is helpful to step away from that and think also about a more spatial collection of metaphors. The learning landscape model is might be one you want to play with inside, a, inside school rather than thinking merely in terms of the learning journey, I would suggest. This is a lovely book. I used to have this on my coffee table when <laughs> looking after school. Uh, Everything Bad is Good for You. What a lovely title. Um, Stephen John is well worth reading, very accessible. I think we've got a couple of copies over in the library. Stephen Johnson does this lovely thought experiment thing where he says, what happens? What would happen if video games came first and then the trendy educators tried to introduce books into the classroom rather than the other way. I will, if you'll indulge me, read to you from this. Here we go. Imagine an alternate world identical to ours, save one techno-historical change. Video games were invented and popularised before books. In this parallel universe, kids have been playing games for centuries. And then these page-bound texts comes along, come along and suddenly they're all the rage. What would the teachers and the parents and the cultural authorities have to say about this frenzy of reading? I suspect it would sound something like this. Reading books chronically understimulates the senses. Unlike the long-standing tradition of game playing, which engages the child in a vivid three-dimensional world filled with moody, moving images and musical soundscapes, navigated and controlled with complex muscular movements, books are simply a barren string of words on the page. Only a small portion of the brain devoted to processing written language is activated during reading while games engage the full range of the sensory and motor cortices. Books are also tragically isolating, while games have for many years engaged the young in complex social interactions with their peers, building and exploring worlds together. Books force the child to sequester him or herself in a quiet space, shut off from interaction with other children. These new libraries that have arisen in recent years to facilitate reading activities are a frightening sight. Dozens of young children, normally so vivacious and socially interactive, sitting alone in cubicles, reading silently, oblivious to their peers. Many children enjoy reading books, of course, and no doubt some of the flights of fancy conveyed by reading have their escapist merits. But for a sizable percentage of the population, books are downright discriminatory. The reading craze of recent years cruelly taunts the 10 million Americans who suffer from dyslexia, a condition that didn't even exist as a condition until printed text came along to stigmatise its sufferers. But perhaps the most dangerous property of these books is that they follow a fixed linear path. You can't control their narratives in any fashion. You simply sit back and have the story dictated to you. For those of us raised on interactive narratives, this property may seem astonishing. Why would anyone want to embark on an adventure utterly choreographed by another person? But today's generation embark on such adventures millions of times a day. They risk, this risks instilling a general passivity in our children, making them feel as though they're powerless to change their circumstances. Reading is not an active, participatory process. It's a submissive one. The book readers of the younger generation are learning to follow the plot instead of learning to lead. It's a lovely idea, isn't it? The rest of the book, as I say, is well worth reading. He makes a very good case for so many elements of popular culture actually being much more complex, much more interesting, much more stimulating than perhaps many of us would give them credit for. 
I wonder if anybody here knows what these people are doing. They're playing a game called Dungeons and Dragons, which was terribly popular back in the late 70s, early 80s. They're sat around a table. There is no board there. There's a hugely complicated set of rules. We have little models of figures, but there's there's, there's no board involved in, in playing this game. It's, it's kind of a game which is done through the medium of text, shared spoken text. There are dice involved to introduce a random element to what's going on here. But essentially, one of these people, I suspect this gentleman here, and it's perhaps not insignificant that they are all gentlemen in the room here, um, is, is the dungeon master. He has the plot here. And the other, the other folk here are, are taking... Each of them has a character which is embedded within this dungeon. And what they're trying to do is, is find a dragon to fight or, or solve a sequence of puzzles or kill the enemy. Or Generally, there's a sort of quest metaphor going on. But this is happening kind of in their shared collective imagination as the dungeon master describes scenes to them and they interact with that and, and describe how their characters would react and choose what their, their, their party of characters would do there. So those of you who are familiar with Tolkien and other fantasy works will be, I'm sure, familiar with the general setting of the, this sort of story. Um, but, yeah, I, I, declaration of interest here. I misspent a large proportion of my time in, I think, what we now call Year 10 and Year 11 playing Dungeons and Dragons with a group of friends. But other people, uh, a lot of other people did that too. It wasn't just me. It really wasn't. Um, so let me play for you a quote from, from one person who, like me, is a recovering Dungeons and Dragons player um, from, I think, a not dissimilar period. He has quite a distinctive voice, and I'd be interested if anybody can figure out who it is before I reveal the silhouette. So here we go. This is. Yeah, I think you're right to say that the whole business of dice roll 20 years ago did have a geekish, nerdy element, and you were automatically presumed to be, you know, rather sad for being interested in it. But I think things have changed. I think that the mathematical component of games playing now has a uh, an attraction, a glamour that it never had before. And I think that the journey of Dungeons & Dragons from the margins through unfashionability to almost becoming part of the mainstream shows us that we can engage young people if we're imaginative enough in the sorts of games that actually get them thinking seriously and give them the sorts of skills which actually make them you know, more rounded and better and more adaptable young people. So did you figure out who that was? Let me do the reveal here for you. None other than our own Secretary of State for Education, Michael Gove himself, admits to having played these games and actually being quite an enthusiast for, for the sort of learning that's taking place in that sort of setting. Remember, this is very much a social process and there's building up imagination. And Gove makes the point there, actually, there's quite a lot of maths happening within those games. Um, that was very much a social process. This, not so much. These are uh, we, these were called fighting fantasy adventure books. We have a collection of these up in the school experience coll collection in the library. If you want to go and have a look at one of these or play with play one of these, what you have here is a book which has a non-linear structure to it. Despite what I said earlier about books, so on each page. Um, you read the text and then you make a decision. So we have a branching narrative within these books. So, you know, do you want to fight the dragon? If yes, turn to page 38. If no, turn to page 127. And so you choose your own path through this story. They also introduced a random element with when you met monsters to fight, you'd have to roll dice and depending on the score would, depend, would determine how the battle went. So a really interesting approach to fiction. Um, the man who wrote these and, and sort of pioneered the journey the uh, genre in Livingston is a person which who we're going to, whose work we're going to return to um, subsequently in this lecture and at other points during the course I believe well we, all being well he's going to come in and do a guest lecture for us later on in the course <coughs> So that was working with traditional media, Dungeons and Dragons, working with text, working with conversation around a big table, fighting fantasy adventure books, working on paper there. Of course, there are ways of automating this, of putting this onto a computer. And look at this lovely white text, black background, trad, old school stuff. We have here the notion of the the 
computer-based adventure game. This version created 11th of March 91. It had been around for a little bit before then. And there's the, this is accessible online. I'll put the link into Blogfolio for you. But let's just have a quick look at that. So what have we got here? Welcome to Zork. Version created. You are in an open field west of a big white house with a boarded front door. There is a small mailbox here. <coughs> I type open mailbox. Opening the mailbox reveals a leaflet. Read leaflet. So we've got a verb object structure to this. So what do we want to do? What do we want to do it with? Okay, and then we get some text about this. So what have we got here? Um, Dungeon is a game of adventure, danger, and low cunning. In it, you will explore some of the most amazing territory ever seen by mortal man. Hardened adventures have run screaming from the terrors contained within. Don't have nightmares, please, folks. And it goes on a little. Um, so let's have a look at where we are again. Open field west of a big white house. So if we go east, we should get to the house. The door is locked. Evidently no key. So open door won't work. The door cannot be open. Let's have a look around the house. You're facing the north side of a white house. Um, oh, open window. Go in. How exciting is this? I'm not going to spoil your fun. Uh, I'd very much encourage you to come play that uh, when we meet together on Friday. Uh, let's move on. So yeah, this sort of thing is... is the, the term for this is interactive fiction. Of course, computers help us to, to create that and play that. Um, but also, we should be thinking not so much in terms of playing games for this course as making games for this course. So let's just have a look a little about how people go about writing interactive fiction and its place in the classroom. I have a short excerpt from a documentary here called Get Lamp. You can understand where the title comes from. Working in our booth on the floor, uh, got a chance to give a short demo for a group of school teachers who were there. And after just the shortest demo I've ever given, they said, oh, this is wonderful. This is just what our students need. It's on their level. They'll be interested. They'll learn from it. And I felt really good about that. Uh, I started teaching in 1968. This last year is my 38th year. Teaching with interactive fiction poses some real, really significant challenges for teachers. It's not an easy technique. It's a wonderfully powerful technique. It's great for helping kids to solve problems, outstanding for improving kids' reading comprehension, unique in its power to help kids read with greater fluency. Writing for Interactive Environments is a class looking at the traditional story structure and then discussing also how it takes place in games, um, drawing analogies to film and other popular media. I give them two weeks. At the start of the two weeks, they've never before seen a piece of interactive fiction. They maybe have never played a text adventure. And they've certainly never programmed um, in form. And at the end, they have to turn something in. So that's the experience. So our, our first things we do in that class is we work on what are good characters and then what are good settings for stories and how those interact with one another. And then we talk about things like puzzle structures. Um, what's a good puzzle? What's a good riddle? In my case, when I'm using IF in teaching, it's not really for the IF. It's not for the interactive fiction at all. It's, in, it's mainly it's for the idea of simulating space, um, and also just to give my students some weird environment that they've never worked in. Uh, usually they become very interested very quickly, and will ask to try some more of that story uh, the next day or very soon thereafter. Write a character but write him four different ways. Show me him from the perspective of his father. Show me him from the perspective of his friend who hates him now because they had an altercation in the past. I mean this is the only form of literature that has built into it aesthetically designed pauses in the process of reading that are that are perfect from a teacher's point of view. You know, among my students who like interactive fiction the least, a certain number complained that it made them think too hard. And um, 
I really don't mind if people complain that I make them think. Actually learn a new form of literature. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, uh, along with many of the other challenges that go with teaching in the current era, um, it, uh, you know, it makes it difficult for, uh, for teachers to work, even if they have one another to support. <laughs> for them, the real challenge is getting them to actually sit down and read a serial, linear, closed narrative. Um, for them, reading is a chore. It's, and that, I find that, it's funny, I, I find myself both ways. I'm like, that's heartbreaking that they think that reading is a, a dead thing. Um, but at the same time, they're writing for a world where they're going to have to craft these broken up, chopped up, sliced and diced narratives for um, different mediums, and they're going to have to learn to adapt. Broken up, chopped up, sliced and diced narratives, chopped up, broken up, and they're going to have to learn to adapt. So what do you think? Um, a new form of literature? Worth exploring, worth experimenting with? Um, I'd be interested to hear your opinions. Um, what have we got here? So, Inform is the thing which was mentioned as one way of designing interactive fiction using a computer. More popular now, I think, is, is this toolkit Quest, which you can download for your PC. I'm hoping that we'll have it installed on the Lullum machines, but you can certainly create interactive fiction using that on the website, so you don't actually need to have the software installed. If you go to textadventures.co.uk, you'll, you'll see a whole collection of stories which other people have written using Quest. So there's, there's a collection of interactive texts there um, which you can play through for yourself. Um, there are educators, there are a number of educators in this country doing really interesting work with interactive fiction. I'm hoping one of those, uh, Christian Still, is going to join us for part of the lecture on Friday via uh, the magic of Skype. So what I'd suggest you do before we meet together is to have a read through at least some of Christian Still's blog and, and think of some questions that you might like to ask him about how he's using interactive fiction, what he sees as the strengths, what he sees perhaps as the weaknesses of this sort of approach. Does it appeal to everybody? But I'm prompting you with questions where it's much better if you come up with questions yourself. You'll notice that things like Zork here and the, the interactive fiction, they are very much text-based. They require you to do at least some of the graphics work in your head. You know, what you have on the tech, on the screen there is, is a textual medium. You're reading stuff, you're writing stuff. Okay, you're writing very short sentences when you're playing one of these games. But it is, is conveyed through the medium of text. And, of course, that's not necessary on a computer these days. It perhaps was back in the days when Zork was invented. But um, you move beyond that now to produce the graphic games. So this is a thing called RuneScape, um, which was terribly popular with the boys at the, the primary school, as I said, I was looking after. And you've got very similar stuff happening down here, as you'd have in traditional in interactive fiction. You've got a whole collection of objects I'm sure you're collecting here. But rather than describing the scene, and then the player reading it, you get to see what's going on in the sort of graphics window here. And you can understand how that might appeal more to a contemporary audience than something like Dear Old Zork. But nevertheless, there perhaps is a place for using something like this, a text-based medium, within this, this context of the non-linear adventure game as a way of encouraging children to read, to use their imagination. Um, again, something which you might want to return to for discussion on Friday. Um, so yeah, um, Rune, Rune Quest here is is popular with um, school children in primary school, or at least it was a few years ago when I was working in school. The other one, which is we can't really not mention, is World of Warcraft. It's a huge, huge multiplayer online adventure game with people spending you know considerable amounts of their time building up their characters within World of Warcraft and going on quests and working with others in guilds to solve really very complex, difficult problems. Um, the first two months playing World of Warcraft, all you're doing there is building up your character to a point where you can actually have some interesting adventure games. It feels a lot to those who play it like work. Um, and indeed, for, for some players, it is work. They're building up characters and selling them to other people to use who, who want to bypass that, that whole learning curve part of the process. Um, you're not going to find World of Warcraft used very much in primary education. Um, you're not actually going to find it used very much in secondary education either. But it is worth pausing and thinking about what sort of learning 
is going on in a game like this. And more interestingly still, why do people keep coming back to this? What is it about a game like World of Warcraft that keeps people so interested in returning to that and building up these characters and going on quests and playing this game? And can we borrow some of those ideas and techniques that these game developers have cottoned onto and bring those inside the classroom to other things? So again, gameplay, very, very interesting, and it's a theme which we return to at other points during the course, but we're also, as I say, interested in creating computer games. The UK has a very um, important computer games industry, but perhaps not as important as it once was. Uh, there was a feeling that we were slipping behind uh, international competitors. So Ed Vasey, who is Minister of State at uh, Department of Culture, Media and Sport with responsibility for um, communication and creative industries commissioned Ian Livingston, you'll remember Ian Livingston from earlier, who's got now a worldwide computer games company that he's in charge of, and Alex Hope, who's an influential figure in the visual effects industry, to write a report about what we can do about the UK games industry and the UK visual effects industries to, to achieve you know, the global prominence that, that these industries are seen as deserving. And the number of their recommendations are particularly relevant to us in our context, so here you go, recommendation number one, bring computer science into the national curriculum as an essential discipline. And this, this predates the, the uh, McTaggart lecture from Eric Schmidt. Uh, recommendation four, one-stop online repository community site for teachers of video games and visual effect education resources. Encourage schools to promote art tech crossover and work-based learning through school clubs. This is a particularly interesting point that it's not just about technology. In order to be a good games developer, you've also got to be a very creative person. Um, the games company that make Little Big Planet, illustrated on the front of the report here, of people who are good programmers and good artists and good games designers. And you've got to have at least two of those three skills in order to get a job for them, which perhaps explains some of the success of their games. But yeah, recommendation number one, you'll see that that is now happening. The new programs of study that are being put together include computer science with a significant as a significant component of the, the rewritten ICT programs of study. So Ian Livingston has been lobbying quite strongly since the publication of the Next Gen report to see computer science there on the national curriculum, to see computer science as an entitlement for everybody. Um, after the, the Gove speech at BET last year, which we talked about back in lecture number one, um, we published this brilliant article in Wired magazine about some of the, the backstory to that, how he f he'd helped to get um, computer science there onto the curriculum. The man who could hand us the key and make next gen's vision happen, the warlock of sanctuary buildings, Michael Gove, from a former Dungeons and Dragons player, wouldn't talk to us. The department said no on his behalf. The gates to sanctuary buildings remained locked. Thanks, but no thanks. Uh, we didn't lose hope. We had just to find another way into the labyrinth. We needed help, and as if by magic, a 60th level warrior appeared in the north. And of course, he's referring there to Eric Smith of Google and the McTaggart lecture, which made, I think, quite a big difference. Okay, so that's what I wanted to talk to you about in advance of the lecture. And as usual, I'd like you to post a question into the Blogfolio discussion space, which hopefully we'll be able to return to in the session. And all being well, we'll have Christian still coming in to talk about how he's using interactive fiction in his secondary school in which he's working. Um, there are other things which we'll be doing. So I want you to think a little about the, the map of your game world. You don't have to do your game uh, with a non-linear structure, but you're more than welcome to do so. So you might like to spend some time drawing that map. There's a lovely tool called Gliffy here, which provides one way of doing that. Um, I wonder if you can figure out what traditional story this would be the appropriate map for. Uh, non-linear there are non-linear ways of organising information which can be very, very appealing. So I don't know if any of you have tried doing mind mapping or concept mapping, but there are really nice tools on a computer to help you do that, to make that process slightly easier. And it's worth exploring those. Um, we'll also spend some time um, designing some background scenes for the game that you're making in Scratch. And I will spend some time showing you how to link those screens together. I have a little slide cast, or, or sorry, I have a little screencast of that, which I'll put into Blogfolio if you want to have a look at that beforehand. And then I'll talk to you about the follow-up work 
um, as pull up to the lecture, otherwise we are really going to get ahead of ourselves. Okay, so as I say, things to do beforehand. Um, read through Christian Stills, a big pardon, Christian Stills blog here, um, and post some questions on either that or what we've talked, what I've talked about during this uh, recording, into the blog folio forum. Okay, that should be it.